Great to see you. I hope you've worshiped the Lord, and I hope you are ready for a roller coaster ride today through His Word. Don't say I didn't warn you, okay? It's a love story. Everybody loves a love story, right? We're, we're safe thinking about this. Well, it's different. <laughs> Hosea, whoo, it's a different kind of love story. But I like to think that we all are in the mood for a good love story because spring is just around the corner. And love is in the air. Or, wait, is that bacon? I can't tell. But love is in the air. If you do an internet search, as I was preparing this, of terms like I love you, and you look for quotes and memes, you will quickly be inundated with adorable animal photos like this one right here. So this is what was going through my mind. I love this. Just, oh, it's just so cute. Or this one right here, for those of you who love, I love you like no otter. Oh, everybody loves this cute little cuddly otter. We all have one as a pet. This is, this is what I'm looking at. But see, as I searched further, I started to see some people who did not appreciate love. Who were bitter. Who were jealous or didn't think it was right that other people had all this love. And, and, and love may be in the air, but when I see that love is in the air, yeah, well, so is the flu. Wash your hands. <laughs> right away I knew I had stumbled into a whole different page of Google searches. In fact, I... Uh, it didn't take long for me to get to the honeymoon couple, the, the perfect married fairy tale. You see it all the time, not just Hallmark movies, but you know the picture. They're on the beach, and the husband lifts up his wife and spins her around as if she just weighs eight pounds and gives her a kiss on the lips. And you think, man, that's, that's, that summarizes my life. You go, wait, that doesn't summarize my life. This is what summarized my life. I'm the guy in the blue over there <laughs> on, the, on the beach on the right. It's kind of over there. We've all been there. No, I mean, not, not saving to us. We're, it's, it's good. It's all good. <laughs> Today, it's a matter of perspective. And I just wanted to prep you. Uh, we're going to look at one of the most amazing love stories of all time. And I have a hard time getting through this. All week long, I fought back tears. Some were tears of joy. And God, how could your love be so amazing? And others were tears of repentance. Here's a word you don't hear much. That's not a popular word. I just want to give you a heads up. If, if this story seems vaguely familiar at all, you may remember three years ago on Valentine's Day, we talked a little bit about Hosea. And then I showed a movie by one of my friends, Rich Cristiano Director. It is phenomenal. If you were here for that movie night, then you may remember a little bit of this. And if you haven't seen this movie, get it. You can send me a thank you note later. It's that good. It is so powerful. It is the story of Hosea set to film. And it is so rich. And it is a love story for the ages. But I have to warn you, and I want to say this up front, give you a heads up as your friendly neighborhood pastor, this is going to be a roller coaster ride, okay? In fact, it's not just that roller coasters are fresh on my mind because we came from Universal and I rode this roller coaster, but I just, I started to zoom in and I wanted to look closer and I realized this is the many expressions. Let's zoom in. You got, you got sheer joy and elation, abject fear, and then Milo here with some kind of, I'm not, I like it, I hate it, I don't know, I just kind of something. So throughout today, you are going to be one of these three people, okay? In fact, if you're like me, you're going to be all three of these people. And it's for good reason. It's okay, okay? So nod your head if you've heard me make my disclaimer. The warning has been issued. We're all safe here. We all in this together. You're in a safe place. This is a no-shame zone, all right? We're going to let God's word speak to us. So with that as our opener, turn to Hosea. Find it if you haven't already. We're going to look at verse 1 or 2. And if you are pulling up a digital app, I'm probably going to read from the NLT for the most of this today. While you pull that up, let me welcome our online guests. Great to have you with us each and every week. Last week, you may remember, we shared that over 600 people are joining us online in a month. That's incredible. So welcome. We know we have several people at home this week with the flu. We're praying for you. May God's word speak to you across the miles. Hosea, verse 1 and verse 2 of chapter 1. Let's just read just the first part of this. When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, go and marry a prostitute. <laughs> okay, wait, what? <laughs> Time out. Pastor, you said this was a love story. That's a love story like no other. I've never seen So surely this gets better. What in the world is this? It has to get better. Well, let's read on, read the next part together. Go and marry a prostitute so that some of her children will be born to you from other men. <laughs> wait. Stop, all right? Worst love story ever. Think about this. Think about what we've just read. Now, I have good news and I have bad news before we go on. 
How many people want the bad news first? Most people like the bad news first? Okay. Well, the good news is this. <laughs> the story does get better. Hear me. The bad news is it gets even worse. And it hits even closer to home. The bad news is it gets a lot worse before it gets better, okay? Why in the world would a great and holy God ask Hosea to do this? Well, to find that out, we have to read just the next verse. Look at it with me. Go do this to illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. Okay. Okay. Now, now I see this is going, uh, I was hoping it wasn't going to go there, but it is going there and we're going to be ready for this. I want to set the scene of what's happened. The great King Solomon has died and the nation is in chaos. In fact, it's so distraught that it has been divided into two kingdoms. You'll see here, there's a northern kingdom made up of ten tribes, it's the large one, that's known as Israel. There's a southern kingdom that's just a couple and that's Judah. This northern kingdom is what we're looking at and it has departed from the faith. Greatly. This used to be the apple of God's eye. This is Israel. My people. And they have so turned their backs on God. They have left their fervent love. That first love. That hunger. And they have strayed and now they are living in open rebellion and sin. It's not just like in the dark. Like, oh, it's a sin. I'm sorry. I repent. It's flagrant. It is out there for all to see. And it is unashamed lying, stealing, cheating, bloodshed, oppression, Slavery, corrupt justices, prostitution, any sexual perversion or immorality you can think of, you can have. It was rampant. Think how far mighty Israel has fallen. They have turned their back on God because, and here's the reason, in every other sense, things are going great. Economically, man, they're a powerhouse. Markets are booming. Things are going great. They've got gold and silver and spices and expensive cloths being sold in the marketplace. And things are going great. Anything you wanted economically you could have. On the surface, everything looked great. They were enjoying blessings from the land that God had done. But here's the deal. They were coasting on previous blessings that had been earned by a previous, more righteous generation. Does that sound at all familiar with our... Not our nation, but our world. Today, there's going to be a lot of parallels. Heads up. Worldwide, for our nation, for our church, and for us as individuals. It is so amazing. They were coasting on all these past blessings because their previous generations were God-fearing people. And they lived a righteous life. I think of our great-grandparents and our grandparents of the greatest generation who went and fought evil. And 18 years old, man, they're out fighting Nazi fascism and, and, and communism and all these horrible things. And then I, I look at some of our current generation, myself included, and I think, could we do that? Man, I get upset if I have a little trickle of sweat. These people were packing a gun and... Storm in Normandy. And I just look at this and, and, and they would have no problem falling on their faces and asking for God's blessing and repenting. Now, if you think this is bad as you look at Israel, think about this. This was a people who just a few years earlier had feared God and loved God with all their heart. But here's the thing. This sin that was creeping in wasn't just in the bedroom. It wasn't just kind of in, you know, like, oh, yeah, pray, pray for them to have... It was out in the open. In fact, it had crept into the temple. It had crept into their own religious worship services. The pagan idol that was mainly worshipped at this time was a guy named Baal. Baal is bad news. It is a demonic, false idol. And guess what his God was known for? Fertility. So to sacrifice to Baal, they literally engaged in sexual practices and immorality. Deviant things, things I can't even speak from the pulpit. Things that were so wicked. Now, here's the deal. To sacrifice to their God, Israel started looking at this and flirting with it. And these idolatrous rituals began to happen alongside their neighbors. And soon it crept into the temple. In fact, the Jewish temple, there were male cultic prostitutes who were now actually being allowed to be housed inside the temple right alongside female prostitutes who were right alongside those sewing cloth to sell 
for pure ritual. So you had Jewish holy ceremonies going along in the holy temple right alongside those who were involved in active demonic worship. It was everywhere. Here's the deal. It was so ubiquitous, it was so everywhere, that it almost became normalized. Huh? It almost came where good people couldn't tell it from the bad, and you were like, well, it's just everywhere. That's just, that's just the culture. Let's just love everybody right where they are. Man, I am all for loving everybody. But I hope you love me enough that if I'm headed towards a cliff, you will grab me and you will say, Matt, you're sinning. That's wrong. Come back. There's a better way. That's not God's best for you. I hope we have that, that, that heart. Here's, here's the promise. And here is, here's your truth grenade for those who like to take notes. This physical idolatry begins first with spiritual idolatry. And it starts in the heart. It's not overnight. It's not this hard right turn. Israel didn't wake up in the morning going, let's divorce God today. <laughs> it was a little tiny step at a time. So it's in this horrible, grotesque, offensive spiritual adultery that's taking place that the Lord raises up a God-fearing righteous man named Hosea. Oh, I don't want to be Hosea. Because he is fighting against the culture. And God calls him up and says, I want you to take my message of holiness to an unholy, unfaithful people. I got to tell you, being a prophet in those days, it was beyond just being mocked and ridiculed and your family being outcast. They were slandered. Sometimes they were persecuted, even killed, torn apart because they dared speak the truth. And Hosea was the only prophet who would come from the northern kingdom, the only one. So I promise you, he knew their sins quite well. He's saying, guys, God's love for you is so deep. He wants to return. He wants you to have that relationship. He wants you to live forever with him in a covenantal relationship. And he has this incredible peace. And you, you know you're miserable. And you can see it. And if you would just turn back to your first love, if you would just come home. And they said, no. And he said, listen, the Assyrians are amassing all around you. The enemy is at your doors. And if you don't repent, they are going to come and invade you, literally, not figuratively. They are going to invade you, take you hostage, and make you slaves. I said, that can't happen. We're the mighty Israel. We've got the greatest army on the planet. Oh, you're full of sin. So God's love is here described and portrayed like that of a caring, faithful husband that's deep and it's tender and it's protective and it's intimate and it's strong and steadfast. While Israel's behavior is being described, on the other hand, is that of a harlot, a self centered, ungrateful prostitute. You get in the picture? Okay, this is crazy. So to underscore Israel's sin, God sends Hosea to come and say, I want you to take a wife who will violate her marriage vows. Not just once, not twice, but repeatedly. And then hold it up in your face. Unrepentant. That's what I want you to do. To love her in spite of her sins. Could you do that? And that's tough. Guys, let me ask you a question. Just, just us men. Ladies, close your ears. How many of us would be able to honor this request? If God came to us, and instead of saying Hosea, if you put your name in here, and it says, remain faithful to your unfaithful wife, could you do that? Because that's exactly what he's saying to do. It is so powerful. It's one of those things. If that was your wife, you know every time she came home from anywhere, you would be looking at her like a side eye. Like, uh -huh, where you been? You know what I'm talking about? Like, like, mm -hmm. you, I've been at the market. I've been shopping. I bought some shoes. Uh-huh, sure. Where you, took seven hours? Where you been? Well, I guess some could shop in seven hours. But this is, this is what he's looking at. He's thinking, and the parallels are astonishing. Now, let's bring it to, to modern day. We say, we, we would never do this. We won't do what Israel did. Personally, pastor, I'm not an adulterer. I would never commit such blatant, flagrant sin repeatedly like that. Again, let me offer a caution before we throw the stones at Israel. Let us look in the mirror and realize Israel's spiritual adultery began with just a little flirtation. It wasn't overnight. It wasn't like, boom, one day. This drifting is something that is so insidious. The warning to us is beware of drifting from God. Drifting away from God, it happens gradually. It's just a little bit at a time. That's the warning. That's why it's called drifting. It's not why it's called sudden, jarring, shifting of your affections. It's almost imperceptible. And just like me and you, spiritual adultery in Israel 
began with the drifting of her affections. Think about that. Think about what that means. This drifting begins when she found herself first just curious. Maybe just a little intrigued. Nothing wrong with that. Maybe slightly attracted to something else, to some other diversion. In this case, it was gods with a little g that are nothing more than demon idols. If we could peel back the curtain, we could see these huge, loathing, drooling, fat, leather, bat-like demons behind them saying, "Eh, worship me (laughs) instead of the one true God. Because they know what's coming for their judgment. And anything they can do to poke the Father one more time before they are sentenced. They love to take the spotlight off the one true God. Think about this. Let me ask you a question. What is it that consumes your attention? We don't have idols today, Pastor. We don't do that. We drift from our love from God. We drift from our allegiance to Christ when we allow other interests to supplant God's. When we allow other preoccupations, other interests, other hobbies, other pursuits, anything that takes your focus and affections away from the Lord can become an idol. Man, you don't hear that very often. But if you don't hear that here in the church, where will you? You won't hear it out there. You won't hear it on Fox News or the Communist News Network. You won't hear it on any of that. It's right here in God's Word. What is it that you find yourself most thinking about? What is it that you focus on? Is it things of the Lord? Is it things of His kingdom? When we do not hold fast to Him, we lose our grip for the very purpose of our lives. You are here for a reason. You are not an accident. I don't care what anybody says. Your life is meant to accomplish something awesome. There is a higher purpose. We're not just supposed to go through the motions. And this spiritual adultery may sound like a harsh term, but when we replace anything other than God for our affections, it is exactly what it is. And Jesus shows up. After his resurrection, we get a peek into heaven when he's talking to the churches. Over in Revelation 2 and 3, and he's addressing them, and he says, you need to repent You need to remember, and you need to come home to your first love. Only after we repent could they return to that first love. Repentance is a word you don't hear much anymore. It makes people uncomfortable. But you know what God's word says? It says repentance is the only road that leads back to holiness. As a world, as an individual, as a nation. Repent. How far have we fallen on our watch? When you can turn on the news and you can hear open, unashamed conversations about whether a born child should remain alive. Heaven help us. We're not talking about first, second, or third trimester. We're not talking about anything political. Long before it was a political, this is an issue of biblical life. When I, and I quote, when a governor, duly elected, could say, well, if that ha- we would take the baby and make the baby comfortable, give it medical attention until the mother and I can have a conversation as a doctor to decide should the baby continue to live. God help us! That's infanticide. And the church is silent. And all it takes... For evil to flourish is for good people like me and you to say nothing. God, forgive us. God, help us. This is a, but if you don't want the child and it's there and he is alive and she's okay, there are thousands waiting in line that would love to give it a home. We've lost two children. We would love to give it a home. Several people in this room are waiting, would love to give it a home. It's not a choice at this point. This is a child. It's separated. It's alive. Can you see how far far? This is what they were doing back then. They were taking their children and they were sacrificing them to the god Molech and the god Baal. Putting them in the fires. They would beat drums loudly enough to drown out the cries. How sick. You think, we don't have idols today. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. And if we don't have the moral clarity to be able to still distinguish what is right and what is clearly wrong, what are we doing? Help us. God, forgive us. 
And that's what was going on. When Hosea shows up and says, repent of your sin, you guys are doing, you're bringing mattresses into the church and you're having fornication on the altar and you're calling it a sacrifice and others applaud it. And some did, by the way, when bills like this come to the floor. If that doesn't break your heart, please check your heart. See what happened in just the next chapter with Hosea? His wife, Gomer, has three children. And we even get to know their names. Their names sound like a curse. And guess what? They are. Their names are so bizarre. Let's exegete this just a little bit. In verse 3, we see the firstborn son would be given the name Jezreel. Guess what it means? God scatters. It's a powerful illustration because soon, guess what? Israel would experience a devastating military defeat. Guess where? In the valley of Jezreel. And guess what? They would be scattered. It was prophetic. And then we see in verse 6, Gomer conceives again and will eventually have a daughter. And God says, Hosea, I want you to name this girl Lo Ruhema. You know what Lo Ruhema means? It means not pitied. I will be shown no mercy. Imagine that. God, are you sure you want me to name my daughter that? This is my daughter, Lo Ruhema. And we would read on that literally the Lord would show these unfaithful people no pity, no mercy. And then in verse 8, when Lo Ruhema is old enough to be weaned, Gomer has another child, this time a son. And God tells Hosea, I want you to name this one Lo Ami, which means <laughs> not my people. They don't act like my people. I don't know them. Not my people. And in verse 9, we see God explains why. For you're not my people, so therefore I will not be your God. You need to make things right. You need to return to me and seek me with all your heart. Church, how you doing with that? When is the last time we wept over our sin? Think about this. Can you imagine Hosea's grief and his heartbrokenness? He's done nothing wrong. He is a godly man. He is a prophet. He's somebody you and I would highly respect. We would love to go to lunch with this guy and pick his brain and hear his wisdom. He is giving the best of his years and all his strength to faithfully preach God's word. And all people do is mock him. They can't stand him. They hate him. He's not politically correct. They go after him and they mock him and ridicule his family and make all kinds of comments. And if the angry crowd is feeling generous on this day, then maybe when he walks into a room, they only just turn their backs on him in silence as he shares God's word. Or walk out of the room altogether when you walk into the room knowing, here I go again, I'm going to clear the room and I haven't even opened my mouth. That's Hosea. He's done nothing wrong. All he's doing is being faithful, and he remains faithful. He's obedient to his Lord, even when everyone around him is not. Do you have the moral clarity to stand firm when everyone else around you says what is evil is good? And what is good is now evil? Because we read in the scriptures that's going to happen. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be before the Lord returns. The days of Noah were wicked. I can't even tell you all the things that happened. It gets worse. This is, this is so crazy. As Hosea walks into the room, the devil spurs these people up time and time again as he holds up God's standard and his love, saying, please repent of your sin and come home. He loves you. He's a father. You just know somebody yells out, why don't you start with your wife? I'll tell you what, Hosea, when she stops her wicked ways, maybe we'll listen to you. And you just know it. There's people there. This good man remaining faithful in spite of the, the taunts and the whispers and the slander, preaching God's love, begging them, stop being unfaithful to your God. You know somebody has a snide comment and says, you know what, at least we're more faithful than your wife. Can you imagine the pain? Can you imagine how each mean-spirited comment feels like a knife? Because, let's be honest, there's a little bit of truth in what they're saying. His wife is unfaithful. She's not holding to the standard, and he's cut to the core. Guess what he does? He prays for them. He goes home to his prayer closet, closes the door, and pours his heart out on behalf of the people again. And he's not angry. He is stunned at their disobedience, at their stubbornness. People who continually are fine to accept the good things from God, pour the blessings out of them. God bless me. God bless America. God bless the world. Yet they continue to poke him in the eye and say, I will not follow the God who provides for me. I will do my own thing. And it's exactly what the enemy said when he was kicked out of heaven. 
I will not follow you. I want my way. And it was a powerful moment. And he's stunned and he's sitting there. You can just imagine the tears pouring down his face as he intercedes for them and for his own wife. And he can't fathom a God who somehow remains faithful to a, pay, a people who is so unfaithful. And then it hits him. Oh, how can you remain faithful? It's because your love for us doesn't depend on us loving you. In other words, because his love for us doesn't depend on our love for him, that's why it is about God and his perfectness and his unfailing love. We don't know how it happened. We don't, scripture doesn't tell us, but Gomer has apparently left Hosea at this point. When we get over to chapter 3 or so, she's not been living at home. Doesn't say where she's living, but she's been spending her nights somewhere else, and you can probably guess. So in chapter 3, just when you hope the roller coaster finally comes up, God gives Hosea an absolutely shocking assignment, one I would not want to have, but it would illustrate his love for Israel and would start the good part of the best love story never told. Look with me in chapter 3. He says this, Then the Lord said to me, Go and love your wife again, even though she commits adultery with another lover. This will illustrate that the Lord, wait for it, still loves Israel even though the people have turned to other gods, little g, even though they love to worship them. So in chapter 3, we see Gomer's hit rock bottom. She's been used over and over again, used and abused and treated like worthless property. And she has bounced from lover to lover to lover, still rejecting her good and faithful husband. And now she has been discarded one more time as if she were something less than human. And we find her evidently being sold in some kind of market. It's incredible. This is, this is as if she was some piece of, of meat. And she's being sold to anyone who would bid on her. Can you imagine the shame? Here she is probably bound, probably unshackled, probably forced to be on her knees. Clothes maybe torn, dirt all over, hair completely a mess. She's been abused, and now here she is wondering if anyone would bid. In public, can you imagine her shame and her utter despair? Her self-worth is shattered, and she probably feels about as low as everyone around her is telling her she is. And it's in this setting that the guy says, will there be no one who will bid on you? Let's start the bidding at five widows, my. And the whispers start, no oh, one's going to bid on that. Oh, so, who is that? Look at, look at Gomer now. Look at her. She was once so pretty. She was the envy. Of, now look at her. And she's reviled. And she's sitting there, and I, my heart goes out to her. And then all of a sudden, a hush falls over the crowd. And the whisper says, what? Who's here? What? And the crowd begins to part. And I can just see, here walks up Hosea. He's in the public setting. And he comes up and they say, will anyone bid on it? Hosea walks through the crowd and he sees his unfaithful wife being auctioned off in front of him. And I bet you could hear a pin drop. And Hosea raises his hand and says, I'll bid. I want her. <laughs> I still love her. Even though she's been unfaithful, I still love her. I always have and I always will. It's the love God has for his church. It's the love God had for Israel. You know what he does? He bids everything he has. In the next verse too, he says, so I bought her back with 15 pieces of silver, five bushels of barley, and a full measure of wine. Church, that is love. He goes, I can't even picture it. Probably scoops her up and carries her home to her defiled marriage bed. He says, that doesn't matter. Yes, you've sinned. But if you repent, I love you. Will you come home? Will you come? What kind of love? Y'all remember their names? The three children? The names that sound like curses? Guess what happens? God lets them change the names. But just a little tweak. Back when we saw that Jezreel meant God scatters, now it has another Hebrew meaning. Very similar, but it means God plants. As in God plants seed to grow up. Hosea 2.23 will literally say, I will sow her now for myself in the earth, indicating he would no longer be scattering them in judgment. 
What kind of God has this mercy? Now they would enjoy a renewed covenant relationship. Remember Lo Ruhema? Hosea is told, drop the low. Instead of meaning no longer pitied or no mercy, her name now means mercy. It's the name of my daughter. Mercy. And God would go on to say, I will now have mercy on those who had not obtained mercy. Remember Lo Ami? Hosea drops the low, and now it's just a me. It used to meant not my people, and now God declares, you are my people, and I am your God. What kind of God forgives? When you put it together, it reads like this. Then I will sow her for myself in the earth. I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people, and they shall say, you are my God. Is there anyone here who would declare he is your God? What love. And then toward the end of Hosea, it gets even better. There's a beautiful verse in Hosea 10, 12 that says this. Sow righteousness for yourselves and reap the fruit of unfailing love. Anybody want unfailing love? Break up that unplowed ground for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and he showers you with his righteousness. What a display of God restoring his broken people. Every one of us have been broken. What a display of God showing mercy when we didn't deserve it. We deserve judgment. It's what his word says. It's not popular. I guarantee you in 90% of the pulpits today, you will not hear that verse. It's a tragedy. Will you step up? Will you live a life with bold moral clarity but still maintaining love? It's what Hosea did. Can I be honest? It wasn't popular. It wasn't popular then, and I promise you, it will not be popular now if you stand for the Lord Jesus. But it's still the right thing to do. In fact, we're going to end differently. Let me have my musicians come up. I want to share with you what happened in a courtroom. Just about this. See, sometimes we hear about criminals in the courtroom complaining when they receive the right sentence for their crimes. They will literally complain and say, that's not right. Even though the evidence is clear and they are convicted and they are clearly guilty, some will still say, that's not right, judge. And they balk. And as they're chained and taken away to the cell, they fight, even though they get exactly what they deserve. But what about when we don't get the punishment we deserve? Nobody complains about that. I certainly don't. And that's what happened here in this story. Israel doesn't get what she deserves. And because of God's mercy, we have that. The church doesn't get the punishment we deserve. Instead, we get unearned, unmerited grace and mercy and forgiveness. What depth of love is this? You may have read the story in the news or maybe even seen it in Ohio. A lady was arrested because she had viciously attacked her neighbor and then pepper sprayed her when she was down. Naturally, the cops came and arrested her. They brought her to jail. And when her day came to come stand in front of the judge, something amazing happened. The judge did something unheard of, and he looked at the guilty person, the assailant, and then he looked at the victim, and he says, I'm going I'm to give you an option here. I'm going to let you decide if you want to go to jail for the next 30 days, or if this victim chooses to repay you an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, I will allow it. If you choose to allow her to come assault you and pepper spray you right here in this courtroom, I will let you go free. It's a true story. The assailant thought about it for a minute. And she picked to be pepper sprayed right there in the courtroom in front of everybody under the bailiff's care. The judge handed this huge, looked like bear pepper spray to her. She walked up to the assailant, the one who had caused her harm. She pulled the trigger. And that assailant braced herself for the searing pain that she had in, inflicted on that person as it went everywhere in the nostrils in the ears breathed it in in the mouth and just she braced herself for the searing pain that never came you see what happened unbeknownst to anyone in the courtroom the judge had substituted a harmless contact saline solution in that bottle The spray caused no harm and no pain. 
Instead of receiving the full penalty that the criminal deserved, that criminal was shown mercy and love. Guess what the criminal's response was? They were broken. They were humbled. For they had received mercy, but there should not have been. That's what God offers to me, to you, to you watching at home. You just got to accept it. You can't be like the northern tribes and say, nope, we're going to live my way. You have a chance. Seize it. Would you bow with me? Let's talk to the Lord about it. God, forgive us. Not only heal our land, Lord, but heal our spirit. Lord, if there's people listening today that don't know you as Savior, God, I pray that in their own words they would tell you it's time. Holy Spirit, we give you permission to come into our life, to seal us, to forgive us as we repent of our sin. Lord, give us the strength to walk 180 degrees in the opposite direction of our sin. We agree with you on the hideousness of sin. We bring it out in the open, as your word tells us to, and we fall on your mercy because that's all we have. Only the shed blood of the Lord Jesus forgives our sin, and we claim that today. God, wash us clean. Thank you for the privilege to call you Abba, Father, because of what Jesus did. The blameless sacrifice, the only, only one that could take away our sin. We accept that. Lord, we thank you for the promise that based on your word, we are a new creation in your eyes. We love you. You're so good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.